the first episode of the next seasonal interaction design lab seminars. So um, today we have Eduardo as our speaker. As you, some of you might know, Eduardo is a postdoc researcher at the Microsoft Center uh, for Social Media. And um, during his master's and later on his PhD, Eduardo research about complex adaptive systems, intelligent agents, context awareness, social networks, and middleware. As I told you, he's now a post postdoctoral research fellow at the Department of Computing and Information System. And parallel to his research, Eduardo worked since 2004 as a senior system engineer and technical consultant at CSER, yeah. am I right? <laughs> um, researching, developing, leading Motorola, Samsung, Campbell Electronics, and Gemalto. Gemalto. Gemalto International Trump. Project. Please welcome Eduardo. Thank you. Wow, thank you. It's, uh, I'm really happy to be here, and I hope we can enjoy this together. This is not a formal presentation, so feel free to discuss anytime you want to interrupt me. Today I'm going to talk about my PhD, that uh, it's about the concept of e-learning, distance education, and I was also trying to introduce a new idea of virtual learning in space. I don't know if you've heard about it but also we're going to discuss about this and I will present my new strategy to support de the development of distributed and context-aware education around the web. So who am I? Um, again, I'm doing my postdoc here in smart cities, context, intelligent agents and related things. But I did my, my graduation, master and PhD in computer science. Um, back in time, when I started in 2000, my BA in the Catholic University of Pernambuco, while well, Brazil is here, I came from Brazil. I have to show this because Michael is always making fun of me. Where is Brazil? Where is, where is your city? <laughs> so Recife is a city in the northeast of Brazil, and this is my city. Um, and I started with computer science, but I was always passionate by education. So. What could I do, even w dealing with uh, technology? Uh, how could I mix and merge my personal interests in education and my love for technology? So as soon as I started my BA in computer science, I tried to have my scientific initiation. So I started in this e-learning new word to me, completely new. So I started studying about Moodle, Blackboard. I guess Blackboard is used here. Aulanet is from Brazil, Teledux from Brazil, Ava is from Brazil, WebCD. So basically I was trying to understand what was e-learning, mobile learning, blended learning, game learning, all of the learnings that exist. But I had also a different um, motivation to research education. And to me, it's because Brazil is one of the world's largest economy, we are really rich, but we also have one of the worst education in the world. So how could I help my country to improve this uh, educational problem? And uh, we are always, always learning. The whole life is a learning process. Like if you think about thousands of years ago or thousands of years that we still don't know, we'll be always learning. So education is always, always hot. We don't have time, even in 2001 when I was studying, when I started studying uh, e-learning, people don't have time. Oh, I don't have time, I can't do that. I'm working in thousands of projects, I'm doing lots of things. Always, we are now a mood test, we do lots of things at the same time, but we also want to improve ourselves. So we want to improve our skills uh, and qualities and what else. So I saw an opportunity to improve uh, uh, myself and to have fun with e-learning. And I was really excited to explore this new world. So before studying um, about e-learning and understanding, I was also trying to improve my background in education. I didn't know, I wasn't, by that time, I didn't have experience teaching. So what about education? If I, if I want to do something with technology to improve education in virtual, learning environments, I have to know uh, about education. 
So the first idea that came to me when I started looking at, at education was <coughs> that we are creativity. Uh, we are always innovating. Doesn't matter if we are in the bus or in the laundry or just enjoying the sunshine or what else. And also we can see now, especially now with the app stores. Why? Because we have children, teen teenagers, like people that are coding and developing for people. So we don't have barriers. So from Brazil, I can build apps for all around the world. From here, we can build things for all around the world. So the world is much more connected. So we can see how people are creative. And we are creatives because we are unique. We are different. We have different cultures, different costumes. We have, we have different uh, learnings and process and what else. So we are all unique. One thing that is really interesting that Picasso said is that every child is an artist and the problem is staying an artist when you grow up. And I completely agree with this. And we are artists because when we are children, we don't have fear to try to get wrong. So if you don't know that you can have a serious problem trying something like this, you will try. But um, in a very beautiful speech and wonderful speech, Ken Robson said in TED that if you are not prepared to be wrong, you will never come up with anything original. And what happens to me is that since the past, uh, from the Egypt, like the Fertile Crescent or the, the Old Greek, or also the religious schools, what we have in education is something that uh, education was in industrialized. So basically we have the school uh, in the middle of like, we have inputs of people, we process these people, and then we give these people as an output like uh, what we want to teach them, uh, what we want to share with them, how we want to code the knowledge to share this around people. And basically, uh, it's in the DNA of school, the main mission, this happens because of the main mission, is the same along the year. It's about teaching. And the way that we teach is like sharing information about uh, using memorization, using metaphors, and things like this. And I was talking to Carol uh, this week, and she said like, look, I can remember about songs that I've heard like years ago lots of years ago, but I can't remember the, some of the contents that I learned when I was at school. Because it's not a big adventure, it's not exciting as, as it's expected to be. So something that is really interesting to me is that I can see this around here. This to me is hack schooling, students taking care, taking like feeling empowered at uni so they can share their knowledge here. And I guess that the schools are missing this. How can we empower students Hack schooling, what is an adventure here? So in Brazil, for example, last year, uh, something like six million hours of game were played every day. So there is a big effort to play game, but there is a big effort to learn. So I was studying this because I have to know what, what was missing in the education. What could I bring as innovation to the e-learning world? And Peter Drucker said something like, the main role of schools today is in the socialization process and not in the learning process. And if he is right, and I think he is, so this was one of the questions that came to me a few years ago. What's the main role of education in schools, universities, in all different levels? What's the main role? And also, I perceive that if we are all unique, why? in the school or the university, we are treated as if we were the same. So if you have something different at school, maybe they will say that you have ADHD, for example. And they will not deal with you as a special education process. They will not try to excite you in a different way. They will not give you this. The second thing was that we cannot predict the future. So the world is changed in an unpredictable way. And what about education? So this was a question when I was, uh, oh, this was, uh, it's something interesting that I found on, on the internet. Children who start this school this year will ret retire in 2073. And we don't know how be the world for in the next five years. So imagine that now we are preparing people for the future, that we still don't know what is this future. 
I was in Sao Paulo in Brazil and I saw, uh, I watched this seminar and it was really interesting because one of the girls did this question. If a doctor and a teacher slept for 100 years and woke up today in 2015, the doctor would enter the operating room to perform an operation, a surgery, and the teacher could teach in the same classroom. I don't know, I will not discuss this now. I don't want to get in trouble. But this is the, an old classroom, this is a new classroom. The infrastructure, the way uh, it's, uh, it's not being reinvented. And also this was a surgery room and this is a new surgery room. So I want to share something. as dynamic, make your classroom as dynamic as the world around us. So I don't know if this is right, uh, the English, I was trying to make it clear, but to me it's like we have to learn to unlearn to relearn. When I started working in Caesar in 2004, I was a specialist in Java and E. I was one of the guys that was really proud to code for Motorola for that kind of mobile phone. Java and E doesn't exist, it's not used. So when I was in 2008, Samsung came with a very big project to us, introducing BADA, the new operating system. And was like, they spent millions of billions of thousands of these, lots of mobile device, SDK, uh, developers, lots of things. And I, again, I was one of the guys, one of the first guys in Brazil and around the world to know BADA. I had a blog. I was a technical writer for Samsung. I was sharing this knowledge, but it doesn't exist. So lots of time I had to learn to unlearn. Okay, I know Java Me. I don't want to know more Java Me because I have to relearn Bada. And now Bada doesn't exist. And I learned Android. And I don't know if Android will be the hot topic in the future. And now I'm here studying something that is really different from what I started working with that was mobile device and now I'm working with sensors in the city uh, trying to understand the city as a smart city, a smart place, a better place and it's something completely different. So are we preparing our students for the future? Problem solving, critical thinking, leadership, responsibility. So. I was with this in my mind, like how to teach students to think autonomously, proactive, how to encourage them to research, how to socialize them. And imagine that, for example, we are connected, but there is a work, and I can't remember the name of the guy, that he was asking, could we have a new Silicon Valley because people are all connected? For example, oh, I can work in Brazil, 
with a guy from Australia and a guy from England, but he said like, no, because what makes this place different is because when you have lunch, you have a conversation with someone. When you have a cough, you have a conversation with someone. So it's much more than this uh, connection, informal connection with people. So after better understanding people needs and people behavior, and this was a kind of HCI, but I didn't know that was, because I was trying to understand people need. I realized that e-learning and traditional education, they are not the same, but they have similarities. And I decided to jump in head into this e-learning world. It's me, it was really crazy, it was this young problem. <laughs> so I decided, and then I became like, into papers and what is learning, what is happening, and so I was really, uh, I started this in 2001 as a scientific, uh, in, a, in a scientific initiation program, but I was also doing this during my master's and my PhD. So I spent 12 years just studying e-learning, and because wasn't enough just reading, I decided that I wanna do it by myself. So in 2007, I became a professor at the Open University of Brazil. We have millions of students in e-learning um, and also in the Federal University of Pernambuco. So I was a tutor, like I was the guy for one year that was only in the forum and providing supports to students. But I also worked for two years as a professor, so I was responsible for the exams and and how to customize the, the visual learning environment and things like that. And I also was a content provider two years later. So I wrote three books. That was a very interesting experience. Writing books for e-learning people and students is not like writing a white paper or a paper or what else. It's completely different. And I also have lots of lessons that I shared on YouTube. So I was trying to be like living this new world to do the best that I could do. So I realized that one man is not enough when you deal with e-learning because when you have one man, you have discontentment. At least we have to have four men. We have to have engagement, we have to have empowerment, we have to have treatment, and we also have to have comm commitment. If you are not committed, if you don't give feedbacks, if you don't give attention, if you don't prepare yourself, to be in contact with students. If you are a student and you are not ready to understand this new paradigm, will not work. But also the most important to me, the meant that is the best one, is involvement. If you are not involved, will not work. So e-learning, uh, we have the facility and the advantage to have to learn with physical distance. We have time flexibility, but we cannot be far from a constructive relationship. And even with day learning growing all around the world, even with the digital universe uh, growing, and more than, for example, 25% of Brazilian students are in e-learning course, and 25% of 200 million people is more than all the ones that are here in this country studying and learning every day. Even with the costs that are cheap than the traditional education because you don't have to get a car to have these extra uh, costs, e-learning have lots of challenges. And one of the challenge is uh, the contents are centralized. So for example, here, if you want to have access to Blackboard, you have to go to the Blackboard that is here at Uni. If you want to access Moodle or Coursera, you have to type the address and then you go to that address. So it's not shared around the world. It's, a, it's a, like a website or a, a, a virtual place that you go and you can access that knowledge. They are quite similar, so they have some collaborative tools and quite similar interface with Forum Week, Calendar, what else. And they are static most of the time. They don't have context. They don't have personal recommendations, so Eduardo has a specific need. How can I help him? His need is different from all of the other students, so what can I do? So we have to adapt ourselves in many ways, professors and students, because we have to deal with isolation feeling, so we are not like here. 
uh, we are sometimes alone in our room or traveling or what else. The contents are different. We can provide like a PDF. Oh, everything is there. You have 200 pages, 2,000 pages. Why you don't study? Come on. Do you feel excited? If you, if you don't feel happy to teach, how can someone be happy to learn with you? The interface is not that good. So sometimes when you work with math, physical, or whatever else, you want to, to share your problem with uh, a formula. How can you do that? How can you explain? And the user experience is not quite exciting like you can see in social networks, the chaotic and dynamic digital environment that we have. So we are digital nomads now. So for example, in Brazil was really common the Orkut social network and now doesn't exist. And we are always changing. Maybe this year, next year, we will have a new hot app and something that is more exciting. So we have lots of this. And what about e-learning? What, what should we do? What could we do? So I started studying computer support, cooperative work, group work, computer support, collaborative learning. And I also, because I was in CSER, I had the opportunity to know what was HCI. So I started like, OK, I was a professor. I was a student. I was a researcher. Now I want to listen more to the students. So I did studies and research, observation, and I brought uh, the ideas that we came with this, that studs and observation. We did lots of ideation. We prototyped lots of things. We evaluated. What was really crazy, this process. Lots of people were involved. We came across with different problems, like we created a new forum. This is a new forum of discussion that we created based on feedbacks and the communication problems that we perceived in the traditional forums, digital forums. We studied lots of collaborate, collaborative models, so we, we understood that to have communication, we will uh, generate commitments that should be managed by the coordination. The coordination is also uh, someone that can assign tasks and to cooperate between themselves, the students. Uh, th this will demand communication. So we started studying and understanding the collaborative things and the context. So context is uh, what underlies the ability to define what is relevant at any given time. For example, if I come to Sarah and I say, congratulations, she knows. Why am I saying congratulations? You don't know because you're in a different context. When you're typing your email, for example, if I'm trying to send an email to Frank, then I forgot to send also to Sarah and Tuong and what else, the Gmail will say just to me, uh, do you want to also include Sarah and Tuong and John, for example, because he knows that that is part of my context. So he's treating me like as a, a, a different individual, a different person, a special person. But how can I understand people? So in this study, I decided to uh, study the MBTI, Mia Briggs Type Indicator from Carl Jung, that have 16 different uh, types of personality. And I was working together with the psychology department because I didn't know what this means. So for example, what is ESTJ? I know that was like extrovert and this and that, but what it means, how these people behave here, uh, what, what should I do if I have someone that is like ASTJ in, in my environment? So we did a big study with this, and based on this, we could identify how specific and different people could behave in the learning environments. So the idea was to identify one guy in the middle of millions of people and treat him like in a different way. So we tried to answer this, who, when, where, what, why, and how. Uh, who was the user of the e-learning system that we were trying to create or what else. When they access the system, where they use the system, what they do in the system, why they use the system, how they use the system. Then we came up with this first idea. So imagine that we have two different users. One of them had a bad exam score, like, oh my god, he got like two or three, I don't know. But the other one, yeah, I was really good. This exam was easy to me. So we created, uh, created uh, an intelligent agent that all of the actions that happened in this virtual learning environment that was created as part of my project, I was leading this team 
I couldn't do this because I was also researching my masters by, uh, by myself, but this was a project about that took us one and a half year, but I built the virtual learning, uh, the virtual agent. And this intelligent agent was responsible for any kind of interaction he was monitoring. And what he did, this is one of the examples, bad exam, good exam. So by accessing the profiles, the MBTIs, oh, this guy loves to interact with people and also that guy. So how, why not connect or recommend these students between themselves? Hey, John, you, you know that Mary wasn't that good in the exam. Why you don't try to help her? Or how to improve this inside the virtual learning environment? And also, if he realized that, oh, this guy is really bad, he's never interacting, and also that guy, but they need help. Students like this need help, and doesn't matter. If, even if I try to con connect them, it, it won't work. So by himself, the intelligence agent was able to post a new message in the forum. So, hey, do you know what is this or that in the same related area? And also something that was interesting was uh, someone that was trying to send a message to another guy, but the guy hated receiving message, but he was always in the forum. Oh, Bob is always in the forum. So why, why he needs to receive a message? He's never looking at the messages inside the environment. So the intelligent agent got the same content of the message, but we sent as a new post in the forum. And he knew that was private to him. This was part of the framework. And as soon as he answered this, the guy that sent the message received it as a message. So in the same environment, they had different interface and different perceptions in the environment. So this was the first, uh, the first study that we did, the first research. These are the MBTI. So basically, we had this intelligent agent that could be used on Twitter, uh, any website, or what else. But that wasn't enough. I wasn't feeling happy with that. Even being different and trying with dealing with each user in a different way, well, we came back to research with users and now was with 35 e-learning students from the university that, that I was teaching. And then I came with finally with this problem. Students do not perceive the advances in virtual learning environments or learning man management systems at the same speed with which sense chance in social networks or more, for example. So how to provide distributed and context sensitive learning contents around existing internet resources on the web? So this was my hypothesis. If e-learning students can access the contents of their virtual learning course in a context sensitive and distributed manner to the internet resource that they already know. So imagine that now, instead of going to a virtual learning environment, if you are on Twitter, MSN, WhatsApp, Skype, Gmail, I don't care. I guess that because you don't have time, because if you have your mobile now and you are on WhatsApp, why you can't learn through the WhatsApp? It makes no sense to me that you cannot access this kind of knowledge. So maybe they will feel encouraged to interact more in this resource to fetch contents of their virtual course. So that to me was like, oh, this could be really a revolution. Let's see what happened. Then the goal was to propose an intelligent framework to support the development of distributed and context sensitive learning. So from virtual learning environment, I was trying to build something that was virtual learning space. And this was a huge um, uh, change in the field. Virtual learning space to me was something like this, anyone, anytime, anywhere learning. Uh, I don't know, I didn't see this term. Uh, I don't know if you've heard about this before, virtual learning space. So basically the idea of this work was to build an intelligent agent that could interact with the student in any web environment, social network, or system, or what else. So the student, basically, if you are on Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp, I don't know, you can think any of this, then you could be in contact with an intelligent agent to ask him about contents. 
and the intelligent agent uh, was also accessing an MBTI from each student. To give him context, so what happened was this, uh, even with uh, share, even sharing the intelligent agent around the web, I was integrating and consolidating all of the distributed data in one database. So what we did was something like this. The user connects to any site or social network that is integrated with our framework, for example, on Twitter, or, M or here is the JITalk. So imagine that on JITalk, I am edu at gmail.com. On MSN, I am user x at hotmail.com. On Skype, I was blah blah at outlook.com. How could I perceive the same user with different logins in different platforms to treat him as the same user? That was a challenge. So sharing the knowledge was easy because I got the intelligent agent that was connected with all of these uh, social networks or web environments, but how to know that Eduardo that have thousands of different logins was the same guy? So with this was possible to do things like on Skype, I was asking like, do you know what is Java? Do you know how to code in Java? Uh, what is a Java programming language? So on Facebook, that is different. If I ask him just this, could you please suggest me a book? A book of what? Who is this guy? Oh, this is the guy that was talking to me in a different environment about Java. So he's asking me about books of Java and not different books. So this was uh, the idea of the virtual learning space. So here it's an example, it's in Portuguese, what is a main, the main program in C, and here uh, main, oh, we just talked about this. Even in a different environment, he was able to perceive the same user. So same user interacts from different web environments. And this was a presentation, but I guess that I, this was just showing in, an event. So to start the model, I was uh, just connecting to, and at that time, MSN, Talk, Twitter. So here I was just enabling everything, running the intelligent agent. This can be applied in different domains, I don't care. This is a standalone app, so anything that I send to the agent, I will receive it back and answer. So here, for example, I was asking, um, hi. And it's a normal user in, on MSN. It's not something that is special. You have to install or you have to learn how to work on MSN. So it's the same. So I was integrating the environment to natural language processing. So I had to study natural language process because I didn't know how to process these kind of things. So I started communicating with the agent on MSN. What is a main? It's the same, I print screen for that screen. So when the program is started, blah, blah, he's teaching what is a main. Then when I went to Gtalk, hi, what is a main? And then he gives me the answer. But if I started asking more, about main, 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 he could perceive, oh, he's really uh, with problems about this content. So I started like here, main, 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 just to force something, just to make the agents uh, think that, oh, he's really worried. And then I got back to MSN, main, and then he realizes that, oh, we just talked about this in the other environment. So everything was integrated. So this was the architecture, I'll not show this. But the idea is this, we have applications, we have a service that is a service-oriented architecture. Basically, to build this, we built an intelligent agent, natural language processing. We worked with inference engines, data interpreter, data integrator, data interoperability, case-based uh, reasoning. The benefits is the distribution of content. I don't care whatever, anywhere you are, like any system or two, you can access the, for example, imagine that instead of 
going to the blackboard from here, you can just type something on Twitter or Facebook or what else. Everything was integrated. I was personalizing the contents for you based on your MBTI. And I don't care if you started talking to me on Facebook or MSN or what else, and was adaptive. If you were using a mobile device, the contents were different. If you were on Twitter, because we have a restriction of 140 uh, characters, um, the contents were adapted. So we had a service. And to get connected with this, you just have to implement one line of code. It's only one method. Basically, I want you to provide me your question and, I will, and the environment that you are, and I will provide you an answer. So I tried this on a very old mobile phone, on MSN, Twitter, on the virtual learning environment that we built, Gmail, so the agent was able to receive an email and to answer to you, on Skype, Facebook, and Gtalk. So it was a strategy of doing something key, keep it super simple, easy to use, mobile and social. This project uh, had almost two years of coding, six months testing, more than 15,000 lines of code, updates in lots of APIs in open source um, uh, societies, and we provide this, and lots of things. Some of the results, uh, the most used environment at that time was MSN, and also later was the Gtalk and Twitter because of the restriction with Twitter. The eight, eight different MBTI profiles were um, uh, perceived. We started a pretest with Moodle to check how people were using and interacting Moodle, and was really low, like uh, the frequency was really, really down. And then when we started our new uh, test with 35 students in programming one, that was my subject at uni, and I applied survey and logs for two months, I had the interactions um, increased more than 200%. was really interesting because, and one of the interesting things was this, 54 uh, of all of the interactions weren't about the virtual learning contents of the course, but we're about entertainment. So in the logs was really interesting because at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., there were people talking like, oh, I feel alone, my girl is not here, do you have a girl, do you like to have a drink, or this or that. But I was really happy with that because to me it seems that, like Siri, if you start using your personal intelligent assistant, it's because you trust, because it's a good product. So it was really good to perceive that. And what is your favorite soccer team? What was things like this and that? So it was really, really interesting. And because of this, it was a different experience, a different adventure. And 30, almost 40% was about the virtual course. And this was really good. Uh, the average time of system use was 28 days. Student that most use it from 61 days use it 44 days. The one that least used was five days, and we have an uh, average frequency of interaction of four days every week. Uh, 20 megabytes of logs was a lot. It took a lot of time to analyze all of this, and something like 800 interactions. The questions that we did, uh, the system supports me learning program programmation one. The system is easy to use. I know the environments used by iCollaboration, Gtalk, Twitter, MSN, all of them. That was the idea. The message that I received from the intelligent agent were motivating, uh, was really good. I was interested in, intelligent the, in the intelligent agent message, like was based on my profile, was interesting, was I could perceive something exciting. Uh, I felt less isolated with the intelligent agent, uh, not at all. My participation was great. So what we, at the end of the project, we become with something like this. If you provide me the name of your intelligent agent and you say to me like, oh, I want instance of this running on my website, on Facebook, Twitter, MSN, and you provide me your content, I can give you an instance in 24 hours maximum. So it was really, really simple to use. 
the conclusion is that we created the idea of virtual learning space. Or almost we are trying to improve this. Uh, we increased the interaction between students and content learning. But there are lots to do as future work. Uh, I want to create this agent as a collaborative agent. This was part of the feedback from one of the students. So for example, if they ask about Australia, and no one knows, but I know, I can just provide by typing something, and this is become social and more powerful. I want them to hack the agent. I want to try to test the framework in different domains. I'm doing this in the Living Campus. So now, if you start running with Nike Plus or Run Keeper, I can track with my agent every time that you do your exercise, and I'm analyzing where are you running, uh, frequency of day that people are running, main locations in the city where people are running, and I'm trying to do things like this. Uh, I also want to develop a plugin for the Moodle that I guess it's one of the biggest virtual learning environments uh, because it's free and more else. I want to integrate this with more social networks. I want to improve the natural language processing try different types of personality and behavior models. So we have lots to do. Well, with this paper from 2009 until now, I got 11 uh, publications, two journal papers, one national, one international, four international publications, five national publications. And I, was, I, always, I also received an award as the best PhD thesis of Brazil in 2013 and was really good because I guess it was against more than 70 different theses. And in 2009, with the first ideas, I got the third place. Michael say, oh, you don't have to show the third place. You didn't win. And I'm, well, I'm proud of being the third place. <laughs> That's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Well, I find it interesting taking on user centered design in, in education because it's a very difficult area um, because it's, there's this tension between learn, learning content, learning material, yeah. and being user centered. But there, there's, a, there's a natural tension there, and resolving that tension is not always easy. Um, and one of the ten, perhaps it's in this context that perhaps there's, there's a tension that highlights the next question, and that's um, there's a tension perhaps with you coming to, to integration through integration of platforms and techniques and, and perhaps um, on the flip side people perhaps choosing to be disintegrated mm -hmm. or choosing yeah, to be separate and choosing uh, one platform for one form of communication another platform for another communication and having that, that choice through, through their behaviour um, not unlike you not everybody see you, know, you might have the world is there to be learnt about mm -hmm. Others may want to keep their education world yeah. in a particular context and their social world in another context. Yeah. Um, how, how do you, how, what's your response to that sort of tension or that, 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 that way of perhaps people choosing to have their platform separate? Well, the main idea was trying to avoid to do, again, more of the same to me. I, I didn't want to build a new virtual learning environment because I guess the effort was big and I couldn't do something that was like completely new because I can't compete with big players like Stanford, MIT or what else. So I was trying to have a different experiment, a different experience. I guess that the real revolution, well, this is my opinion, is it's not about technology. For example, if I provide you all with wearable device tablets doesn't mean that you will learn. But I guess that the most important thing is the way that we use technology. How can we insert technology as part of our educational process? So because I couldn't see this, like, how can I, again, create a new virtual learning environment to try to introduce this to students so they will have to learn my new environment or even an old one? But that, to me, wasn't exciting as the digital universe or world or social network is chaotic, but it's dynamic. So what can I do? So the idea was, OK, let me keep them where they are, and let me try to see if they feel excited 
to even talking with their parents, family, friends, boyfriend, girlfriend on Facebook, if they want to just open a new chat to learn. So that was just a new experiment that I didn't see. Like, it's interesting to say that I've been with this, because of this work, when I got one of the conference was in the Silicon Valley and I went to Google and I was discussing about this project with the guy. And it was really interesting to perceive that things were really similar. People were needy about this new technology that we don't know what exactly what is. So I guess it was this. I was trying to give a new use for things that people already know without introducing. Because in my university, there are lots of projects doing new virtual learning environments with digital TV, using, I don't know, any kind of new technology. And I was like, oh my god, I can't compete. I have only three years to do something and will not be, even if I, I'm a good programmer, will be a minimal viable product, but will not be a product. And then that was the idea to do something different in a different way. Everyone was running, well, most of people was running this way. I tried to do something in the opposite way. Uh, was exciting to, to receive. Did you do user studies on, on that, that work? If I used? User studies or field work? Or yeah. And, and what were the findings? What, what were people saying about that? Uh, I have lots. It's because I don't have enough time. I'm preparing now a big journal, international paper with Michael, and if someone wants to and feel that can collaborate. Well, <coughs> lots of, but again, what was exciting by that time, I don't know now. But in 2010, when I tried this five years ago, they felt really excited because of the interaction with the intelligent agent. So, oh, am I talking to a robot? Really? And he's on Twitter? How it works? And then I, oh, look, this is like he's trying to simulate human behavior and this and that because they didn't know about Siri. They weren't like talking to TVs, like now we have Samsung or what else, TVs that you can channel, blah, turn on, turn off. So. This kind of interaction was new, so it was exciting. And also because of this, when they were on MSN, as soon as they add the intelligent agent, he came like a new contact, and hey, how are you with really interesting and exciting message? I didn't want something boring. So the psychologist created, developed for us, the language was really big this, and make the completely different in, in this work. Like, if I'm dealing with teenagers, I have to talk like a teenager. I didn't want to bring the traditional education experience to my agent, like a traditional informal professor. Mm -hmm. So the most impressive outcomes came from these feedbacks, like oh, about the interaction with the intelligent agent and the way that he was providing feedbacks and answers. I guess that this is our next challenge, privacy. Like, not only in this project, but in from 2011 to, until 2013, I worked for the army in Brazil. We tried project with Israel, US, and so because of that, I was always on seminars about privacy, and people were always saying that if we want privacy in the future, we will have to pay for our privacy. So we are always reading articles that Google can track us, Apple can track us, all of them can track us. Facebook knows about us and everything is shared. And I guess this is a challenge. What we try to do, this is a really small experiment. So you decide if you want to share, uh, for example, your different environments. So it's up to you. At least you know what you are doing. It's different when, for example, you have a new smartphone and you doesn't know, but you are also sending lots of data. Or when you have websites that are tracking the public cookies, that are public 
uh, information that you share when you are browsing. So in this way, it was really explicit, like, look, do you want to have access to different environments? You have to share these different logins and IDs. And of course, this is an issue, but this is something that wasn't part of the scope of the interviews or surveys, so I don't know what kind of impact this uh, really had with the students. This is something really big and interesting, but I guess that this is a challenge in every field, in everything from now to, to the future. I don't know if you agree or... Well, I wonder if there are some safeguards that can be built initially with the system. Yeah, maybe. Well, by now, the advantage was because everything was in one database and was one agent, so it was easy to monitor. And I didn't have a massive amount of data. I was only with 35, 60 students. But yeah, if I want to scale this, this will definitely be a challenge. Maybe we can have different intelligent agents trying to find, like, um, I don't know, a normally for normally detection, failure detection, resilience, things like this. So this can become a middleware instead of a framework, something bigger, yeah, I guess. So how many is this? I was wondering, are there any learning theories that influenced your work? My what, sorry? Learning theories. Uh, I started studying, uh, actually the one that I studied more was the constructivism. I read about Vygotsky and Piaget. We tried to add this in our, our research, was really hard. And so we had uh, pedagogical people and psycholo psychologists working with us, but that wasn't something that was in my field. I was like, I wasn't able to understand deep. So what I tried to do was to live by myself. So I was a student of virtual learning environments, a tutor, a professor, and also a content provider. But yeah, I didn't know too much. I studied the collaboration models, the types of personality, but really in the surface, wasn't my, I wasn't able to do that. So I was being guided. I was being supported by other professions. In the PhD, I, I discuss about some of them, but it's really superficial, it's here on the surface. Did you study that uh, it could be one of the reasons that students were excited to participate in this uh, system that they are going to talk with an intelligent agent being a machine? Uh, do you think that it's a good idea to run the system in a situation that the students are not aware yeah, that sure, sure. talking with the, the machine? Because yeah. you know this is a kind of yeah. Turing test yeah. that no, no system has passed maybe comparing the way that the students interact with the system, being aware that there is a machine talking to them, yeah. or they're not giving this information. Yeah, the Turing machine is really interesting. And I guess this is a very interesting experiment. And I guess that because I was teaching for teenagers, they were excited. But if I try this in a different domain, for example, health, I don't know how nurses or doctors could behavior talking with an intelligent agents. If they will be, they will feel safe, or if they will be, I don't know, excited about this. Uh, this is definitely something that I can try. And also, as you said, without sharing that, maybe this is an interesting, like the the, the Turing test. Without saying them that that is uh, an intelligent agent, a machine. Yeah, let's just try to do like. Well, there are lots of strategies. For example, the intelligent agent could be also a student, working in a cooperative way with other students. So instead of asking, for example, as a tutor, he could be learning with the students and discussing with the students, and the students uh, doesn't need to know that that was a, a machine, for example. So we have lots of strategies to explore with the intelligent agent that we aren't exploring because of the time. You know, yeah, did I understand right that um I don't know. In the, in the, in the sort of the, the, the final kind of version of this, the agent doesn't know in advance who the person is. So you, you add them on MSN or something, and then it will figure out that you've got the two accounts. Exactly. And also... And also your behavior and yeah, your personality. Yeah, so how does it... 
um, determine the severity of the oh, As soon as they got in contact, for example, with the agent, hi. Then, hi, I'm the agent, blah, blah. If you want to improve our communication, can you please answer these four questions about the MBTI profile test, personality test? Yeah. So it was up to them to answer. But what was interesting and I didn't mention, for example, if you have a, 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 an initial profile, ESTP, but you are behaving like a different personality, mm. then the intelligent agent was able to update your personality. So for example, if you love um, being challenged with tasks and things like this, but your profile now, it's telling me that you love to read texts. Yep. And then when I perceive I try one, two, three times and I feel that you are not excited, the intelligent agent, so he could update. So next time, instead of providing you a link or a text, he would provide you a challenge. Yep. Interesting. Yeah. Was it actually four questions? Oh, uh, I did the official one, more than 100. But for this one, and was in my company, but it was expensive. So for this one, the, the people from the uni, they got, was five. I have here five questions, yeah. I tried, in my case, it was the same. So I was, oh my god, we don't have to pay this, because we have only five questions. And it's really hard, and sometimes you have the same question, and it's really, it was really interesting to learn about this. It, this is a completely different word to me. I'm not able to understand what this means, but was used. But yes, in this case, we couldn't like send, him, send them out. If you want to do the MBTI, do this, like 100 questions. They would never do. So we provided on Twitter, or in the same uh, um, system, in the same application, like the test, with one question, two, three, and also, if, if we feel that oh, I sent the third question and he, and he didn't answer, we could interrupt. We record the two uh, first questions, and then next time we could try again. Oh, now he's interacting. Hey, can you please provide me this answer? And can you please? And then we could like complete this puzzle. So was this this was a strategy to to make them feel excited? Wasn't easy, but it was really exciting. <laughs> this was the biggest adventure that I had. Thank you so much. Okay, please join me thanking it.